Hi everyone, I'm Jessica Zartler with The Common Stack and I'm here with Luke Duncan, a member of the token engineering community who's building so many things, uh, working as a core contributor with Aragon, um, founder of OneHive, working with uh, Bright ID as an advisor and also of course um, an advisor for The Common Stack. First, tell us a little bit about OneHive before we dive into governance. Um, OneHive is a, a DAO uh, that uh, myself uh, and a number of other community members have been working on for about a year now. Um, we've kind of experimented with a, a few different things. We've built lots of like mechanisms and we're trying to dog food them along the way. Um, and we're excited right now because we just launched like what we consider to sort of be our like MVP like DAO uh, on XDAI uh, using the conviction voting mechanism as sort of the, the primary way that we allocate resources. So tell us a little bit about conviction voting. I think this concept of real-time voting and signaling is still very new for some people. Conviction voting, I feel like voting is almost like uh, a red herring um, in, in the sense that the interaction patterns are influencing flows. Um, you're not necessarily making um, like binary consensus-based decisions all of the time. Um, and so when we're using it, we're um, using it to distribute um, tokens. Um, and you. Uh, can stake on the types of uh, like recipients that uh, you think uh, should have tokens, um, and you don't need to like reach like majority consensus uh, or complete consensus on any of these decisions. So, as like an individual member of the one hive community, um, you can make a proposal uh, saying that you want um, uh, this particular thing to be prioritized or to be funded. Um, and you don't need everybody else to agree with you. You just need um, sufficient people within the community to say, hey, that's something we approve of. Um, and it allows the community to explore in many different directions simultaneously um, and, and more organically without having sort of a um, relatively centralized process where everybody says, we're going in this one direction, it's the one direction that we're gonna go. And how do you um, think of this as fitting into feedback loops? Um, do you think that this kind of, uh, in a way, it kind of speeds up the feedback process, but then it also allows for this like space for the development of kind of changing opinions and um, it as a signal. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so it, the uh, time dynamics within conviction voting are really fascinating um, because you can uh, have many, many different proposals on the table at different times um, and you can uh, you can explore things with less uh, um, less need for everybody to be involved because uh, like small initiatives take less uh, uh, conviction to, to pass. Um, so you can explore parallel paths much, much quicker. Um, but um, as you try and like um, uh, try and do things, there's a constraint in terms of how quickly uh, proposals will pass. Um, there's a like global constraint on how quickly funds can be released. Um, and so you, um, you have this rate of change within the system um, where like the system can go in many dire directions. It can change directions over time, um, but the change to a certain degree is gradual. Um, and this allows people to participate um, and enter or exit the, the system um, and sort of depend uh, on it acting in a predictable way. Um, so if you compare this to like other forms of decision making, um, uh, you, you always have this risk that um, somebody uh, is going to come along and pass a vote that you disagree with and it'll be instantaneously and you'll have a very, very bad day. Um, it, with conviction voting, um, decisions are like limited um, in terms of their impact um, over time. Um, so you, you can have big, big impact uh, over a long period of time, you can have small impact over a, a short period of time, but as like a, an individual participant, you know that like uh, you're going to have, have a chance to respond to those big, big impact things. There's still kind of a big debate, you know, do we keep a separate layer um, for tokens and how much of that fit in? And, and um, just speaking into a little bit about, you know, people are concerned about plutocracies and how do you see um, tokens becoming more flexible in this kind of mechanism? Yeah, so the way that we're using a token is as a community currency. You're treating it like not necessarily as a specific utility token for any specific thing. It's not a work token. Um, it's very much to kind of define our community values and, and the boundaries around our community. So if you hold honey, um, you're constantly being kind of inflated to support all of the activities that everybody within the community that also holds honey is supporting. I think that we'll see a lot more like local community currencies as sort of 
uh, a way to align uh, incentives and, and coordinate activity. But uh, I think that the importance of um, like fair distributions and equitable distribution models and uh, incorporating like uh, people in, in the process, like having human centric DAOs um, is, is really valuable. So we're, we're actually like in the process right now in a, a hackathon project, uh, integrating bright ID so that we can distribute tokens um, based on like civil resistant identity mechanisms. Um, we're looking forward to, to using that like foundation to also explore like quadratic conviction voting um, so that like, even though you have uh, like a capital based sort of like vector um, in terms of using a currency to like make decisions, um, you're, you're able to balance that out um, with a kind of more uh, human or social centric uh, vector as well. So can we go ahead and jump in? Um, you were going to give us a little walkthrough of the dashboard and show us what does this actually look like um, when we have tokens in play. I feel like there's a no honey, no money. Honey no, is money. No, no honey, no governance. <laughs> this is our like MVP dashboard. Wallet balance will show up here um, and uh, the tokens that are inactive, like not staked on proposals will show up here. And right now I've got zero because I'm staking on both of these proposals. Um, and all of the active proposals are listed on the, the front page. Um, if we go to close proposals, we see some of the proposals we've uh, passed in the, uh, the past few weeks. Uh, pretty much anything, anybody can submit a proposal. We've got uh, honey that was distributed for like the initial work on this like MVP. We've got uh, like uh, recovery uh, proposals. Um, so it, it's very open-ended in terms of like what uh, proposals are there. If you have an active proposal, You'll notice that the amount of conviction required um, differs depending on the uh, the proposal. So this proposal for social cred um, was requesting 330 honey, um, and so in order to actually execute, um, it needs 13% of all of the conviction to accrue. Um, in this case, it was requesting a little bit more, um, so it it needs 19%. Is that assigned from the community, or is that algorithmically assigned? Uh, that's algorithmically assigned. Um, it uh, is based on the uh, total funds available uh, in the common pool. So um, the way this uh, this mechanism works is we have a token supply. There's currently 21 uh, and a half thousand honey uh, in, in existence. Each block, um, we uh, accrue uh, additional honey. Um, and if I click this like little honey icon, It'll actually like calculate the last time uh, it was updated, and then it'll update the balances here and here. Each time uh, somebody clicks that button, we get a little bit more uh, funds in the, the common pool, and these percentages will decrease. So now this actually goes from 19% to 18% um, because that, that algorithm is balancing the reserve pool um, with the like proposals that we're allocating. When we have more funds available, it becomes easier to pass larger proposals. When there's fewer funds, uh, it becomes uh, impossible in some cases. And was this launched on a bonding curve? Is this continuous um, token creation? This is not attached to a bonding curve currently. So this is um, just a disconnected token, a token that's not collateralized by anything. Um, we have liquidity on uh, like a Uniswap instance, which is where we're getting all of this like price information. In the gardens template, um, which we've been working on, we have uh, a bonding curve design uh, that has some of the augmented bonding curve features. And we want to play around with that. But my feeling is that uh, we can start with the simplest mechanisms first and then build, build on that. Sure. And if you can just walk us through, how would somebody start to interact with this? And can you walk us through what would voting on a proposal look like? The required conviction to pass any proposal, it's dependent on the amount of honey. And since this is a, a small amount, it has the minimum, which is around 1%. But if I like increase it, you'll see it, it shows 2%. Uh, if I go to 1,000, it'll say this will never pass right now, just because that's requesting too much of the available supply. So it gives you kind of a little guidance. Yeah, and it's a dynamic system. So like the guide is always going to be an estimate. The way the staking works is you can choose to support a proposal. So this one I'm already supported and the amount of tokens, I get this like slider and I can change this over time. We have this like progress indicator. There's like a dark, darker like teal and then a lighter teal here and then gray. The lighter teal indicates how much conviction will eventually accrue over time based on what's currently staked there. So if I decrease my support, then we'll see like this red indicator 
the support that was I, I was applying is going to start decreasing, but it's still technically supported. And um, this is kind of the conviction mechanism at work where it's sort of doing flows over time. So when I immediately unstake, it doesn't go to zero. Um, mm -hmm. And there's other people kind of staking. So like the contribution amount is there. And then I could go and stake to this other proposal. How does the time factor work here? There isn't a time limit. If you submit a proposal, um, it's kind of on the table until it's withdrawn. As the proposer, you could withdraw. You could say this isn't going to pass. And even if it were to pass, I'm not interested in kind of doing the, the stuff associated to it. So I'm going to withdraw. But there isn't by default like a time constraint. What happens when it passes? When it passes, there's like an option to execute it and the a request amount moves from the common pool to the beneficiary address. We are trusting that you will perform the work because you might want to make proposals in the future and they're unlikely to pass if you like run off with the funds. Uh, yes. And it's very much like a trusted kind of reputation thing uh, that I think will work like reasonably well at small scales. There's lots of things that we could do here in terms of improving the mechanism. Like there could be an escrow flow, which is thing that the common stack and give it uh, are very interested in and I, I think would be super helpful, but we don't have that yet. I, I think what we're, where we're at is sort of like the uh, very, very rough MVP stage. And as soon as like we, uh, we start iterating and improving and getting to some of those like other, other pieces, like it, it becomes more useful and more interesting. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm excited to kind of start down that, that path and, uh, and hopefully um, uh, the community can sort of shape the, the things that we work on on next. And, and that's what the common stack and the token engineering community wants to see is this ultimate system where you can have um, augmented bonding curve for um, self funding, you could have it tied to the conviction voting for governance, and then, um, of course, accountability, and then some kind of dashboard. Mm -hmm. But first, um, to do it responsibly. Um, like you said, CAD CAD is very important to be able to model these systems and play with them and test them and push them and maybe break them <laughs> releasing them out into the wild. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Break, break things before they're like out in production is, is always <laughs> ideal. We like don't have the best documentation, but uh, we're very friendly people. So uh, come, <laughs> come hang out. And, uh, and if you're interested in getting involved in testing things out, um, like we can walk you through the process of, of getting getting set, set up on XDI and submitting your first proposal. All right. Well, thank you so much, Luke. Appreciate your time and uh, look forward to seeing how this progresses. Thank you.